Every monotheistic religion agrees that God is the creator, the all-powerful, all-knowing personality that dictates the fate of living beings. But religions differ profoundly on exactly what this means for us as individuals. Mainstream Islam mentions repeatedly that God is to be feared and obeyed. He is an authoritarian ruler that rewards those who are loyal and punishes those who stray from his command. Those who survive the day of judgement can enjoy delights in heaven and those who don't are condemned for eternity. Christianity has a more elevated understanding of our relationship. God is to be worshipped and enjoyed. He is a deity of love who gives us his saving grace. His closeness to humanity is revealed through the miracles, teachings and actions of Christ. But it is fair to say that none of the Abrahamic traditions have gone as far as the Hindu Bhakti movements in revealing the possibility of how we can see God and how we can reach him. Amongst a vast number of Hindu scriptures, the Srimad Bhagavatam stands out in explicitly illustrating what the highest relationships with God look like. When we read the description of Krishna's life, we see the different rasas or modes of enjoyment which the devotees around him display. These rasas come about through spiritual states known as bhavas. Using the relationships of devotees, the Bhagavatam describes them in detail. Bhishma experienced Shantabhav. Outwardly he was centred and poised, but inwardly he saw Krishna as the supreme governor of the universe. Hanuman showed the state of Dasyabhav. As a great servant of Lord Ram, in every situation he delighted in pleasing the needs of his master. The Gopas enjoyed Sakyabhav. As close friends, they had equal status with Krishna. Through play and laughter, they enjoyed a profound openness and freedom based on a loving relationship. Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj were the parents of Krishna and had the state of Vatsalya Baba. They raised him, protected him and relished the sweetness and dearness of having him as their son. The Gopis of Brindavan saw Krishna as their lover. They experienced Madhurya Baba, the highest states of ecstatic devotion in their deep intimacy as well as in their separation from him. In Bhakti philosophy, God is the source of all rasas and all kinds of enjoyment. This is why there are so many different bhavas. Each one is a spiritual state describing the truth of how our soul can relate to him. But there are many, particularly from other faiths, who would find these relationships completely absurd, if not outright blasphemous. How can we look upon God as our son? Or perhaps even worse, how can we see God as our romantic lover? In Bhakti philosophy, there is something known as karma. Karma is desire for this material reality and will always affect us so long as we have a mind and ego which is attached to this world. Prema, however, is divine love and these different bhavas are its expressions. Prema can only manifest once all notions of karma have been abandoned. In other words, we cannot understand these bhavas until we have given up all attraction to the world. So long as we understand these narratives with the limited mind, we will simply superimpose our worldly experience upon them and stain the purity of what is being conveyed. Either they will be dismissed as childish or overly sentimental, or we ourselves will fall into the trap of cheapening these barbers by confusing the love we feel in our worldly relationships with these divine states. Whilst being ruled by our egos, we can mistakenly think we are sailing the highest states of devotion. These bhavas are not relevant to you as you think you are, but you as you really are. They are states of consciousness beyond any ego identity. The whole bhakti path is about this journey from karma to prema. The saints have laid down a disciplined process that we have to undergo. This involves practices such as chanting the name of God, taking the company of other devotees, serving deities in the temple and receiving the initiation of a spiritual master. The Bhagavatam itself takes us through the process of how to attain these bhavas. The meditational stories hold up to the devotee the mindset and the life lessons needed to advance on this devotional path. We are told about the vastness of creation. There are infinite universes that pour out of the body of the Supreme Lord. We learn about the infinite nature of time through the different yugas and kalpas that last trillions of years. By showing this vast cosmic picture, we are made to see how insignificant we are as material persons. However important we may believe our life to be, compared to the magnitude of creation, our life is just a brief fleeting moment. The cosmology of the universe makes us see the infinite nature of God in relation to our temporary existence. The Bhagavatam repeatedly tells us stories such as the one about elephant Gajendra. 
Being the leader of his herd, he enjoyed immense power and status until one fateful day a crocodile catches hold of his leg. Despite all his years of effort and strength, he cannot free himself. Finally, wisdom dawns. He sees that the only person who can relieve him of this situation is God, and so he surrenders to the Lord and is rescued. Gajendra shows us that no matter what we have or who we are, inevitably the world cannot give us happiness. At some point we will lose everything, either through tragedy or through death. One way or another, all our possessions and relationships will pass. Like Gajendra, we too are caught by the crocodile of the material world. We are helpless and powerless. This is not an attitude of resigned depression, but one of absolute maturity. We see that behind this material world is the glory of God. It is only by his grace that we can be taken out of this. Gajendra shows us the dramatic need to give up all of our hopes and depend entirely on God. In the depths of this helpless dependency, we give ourselves in total one-pointedness towards the divine. This is known as Sharanagadi, or complete surrender. We live longing for God alone and not the world. This is where our heart becomes purified of all karma. Then and only then can we have the chance to understand what love really is. We become qualified to enter the Krishna Leela. The different Babas are no longer perceived through the rationale of the mind and senses, but through the eyes of our soul. They become transcendental purged of any worldly ideas. The tenth book of the Bhagavatam shows us that we as individuals who are so insignificant in the cosmic scene, so helpless and dependent, can have the deepest and most profound relationship with God. With a sincere heart we can know him in the most intimate way. The divine suddenly becomes unbelievably accessible to us. When describing the pastimes of Krishna, the Bhagavatam balances the paradox of his seemingly human nature with his status as a Supreme Lord. When it is reported to Mother Yashoda that Krishna has been eating mud, she is furious. Krishna denies it and opens his mouth for her to check, but within it she sees all of creation, the stars, galaxies and many universes. His humanness captivates the mind and heart, but his divinity raises it to a transcendent level. Parental affection is combined with the glory of God. This is how Vatsaliyabhav is transferred to the listener. During the great night of the Rasa Leela dance, the gopis gather round, each of them desperately seeking the affection of Krishna. They experience ecstatic states of longing and separation. In response to their devotion, Krishna expands himself so that each gopi has Krishna for themselves. While being the cowherd lover of these milkmaids, the Bhagavatam shows how Krishna is God and can fully give himself to each devotee and still remain complete. While the mind might judge the Rasalila as just a romantic story, the narrative shows how passionate longing to be near one's lover is elevated to the highest worship of the divine. This is Madhuryabhav. This is the yearning and celebration of the soul's intimate connection with God. The Gopis show us that not only can we be dear to God, we can even claim ownership of him, so that he exists solely for us in all his glory. In the story of Sudama, we hear how Krishna's poverty-stricken friend journeys to Dwaraka to meet him. Not only does Krishna receive Sudama, he abandons everything and runs to him. He even serves him with tears of joy. The Bhagavatam tells us that the personality who creates and supports all that is, who pervades the material universe, also longs to serve those devotees who have given their life to him. These different narrative pastimes are not just stories for children, but eternal illustrations of the relationship that can be realised at the level of the soul. The Srimad Bhagavatam is described as the literary incarnation of God because it is a portal to the ultimate transcendent place. The Hindu Bhakti traditions have the deepest and most profound vision of God. His glory is not simplistically defined by how powerful he is, but also how dear we can be to him. In contrast to other religions, the Bhakti path takes for granted that God is longing for us even more than we are longing for him. It is based on this premise that God enjoys his relationship with us. He is not viewed in a one-dimensional way. He manifests in whatever way our heart sincerely calls to him. These different bhavas exist because divine love has no barriers or restrictions. But so long as we are chasing karma and indulging in worldly affairs, God will be a personality to be used, feared and obeyed. Our ego has to survive him to get what we want. But through the right attitude and spiritual discipline, we can gradually give ourselves to God. 
We can realise our helpless dependency on him. We can see that God is the only thing worth pursuing in life. With a yearning heart, we can surrender and become purified by his grace. This is what takes us to his abode. These are where the different relationships exist. This is the home of divine love. Within this realm, we can know the beating heart of God. It is where we see that the supreme Lord of all creation becomes ours and we become his. This is prema, the ultimate meaning to existence. Many thanks for listening.